Okay, kick it off. <laughs> okay, kick I will. Kick shit off. Yeah, we're finally getting around to doing another David Cronenberg movie. Yeah, Cronenberg, man, he delivers. I, you know, fucking, that, that, he's a Canadian gem. He really well, is. He's a Canadian national treasure. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I love comes it. up with some weird shit, you know what I mean? Although I must say... He's one of a kind, I have to say. This movie, although it's a very good movie, it's one of his better movies in terms of just the way it's filmed and the way it looks and the tone. It's not as weird as, like, say, like, The Brood or Videodrome and shit like that. I like yeah. those a little bit, but those are the ones I grew up with. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. This one's a little more polished. And it's... I think it's because of the subject matter... It trips women out a little bit more than it trips guys out, I think. The thing about this one, uh, we're talking about Dead Ringers, in case yeah. my shirt didn't give it away. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but this is actually, I don't know. For a while, I probably would have said that this was my favorite David Cronenberg movie. I'm not sure because that moves around because, you know, he has so many good ones like Video Drum, The Fly, The Brood, um, the brood like all this other yeah. stuff. So I feel like we've done a lot of Cronenberg. We did yeah. Video Drum. We did. Uh, rabid. Yeah. We did. We do the brood. Probably. I think we did the brood. We might have done shivers as well. Yeah. Uh, so we're kind of working our way through. The, we haven't done like some of his, like you know, we haven't done Existence mm. or Spider or any of his like I think, newer stuff. Eastern Promises. I think in terms <clears> of like groundbreaking shit, I think Video Drums is best movie. Yeah. I it's, think his, it's probably his weirdest. I think the one that affected me the most though was the brood. And maybe because I was younger when I saw it. Yeah. Because it was an older movie, than, and I was pretty young when it came out, and that just was a fucking weird movie. Yeah. The Brood. Especially these, the baby licking at the end. All that shit. Just the whole concept. <laughs> well, his David Cronenberg's whole thing, and Dead Ringers was also kind of a prime example of it, was kind of the what entails from the separation of the mind from the body. You know what I mean? Or like people who are trying to intellectualize themselves like out of the body or like yeah. the weird relationship between... Because I mean, look at the brood where it's like the woman, the babies are basically manifestations of her, like physical manifestations of her emotional, psychological rage. Yeah. Um. You know, so he's... And it's weird. She's like giving birth to him like a queen ant. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Just like it has more and more babies and they fucking serve her. It's like a, a hive mind. And I, I just, just the style of that movie, the time in which it came out, the architecture and involved, early 80s, you know what I mean? And, and the age at which I saw it, you know what I mean? That movie affected me. I think yeah. more so than, than Videodrome. Yeah, I could see that. It was just odd. It's weird. A, yeah, I mean, and weird. I think a lot of... David Cronenberg, I feel like he gets a lot of the same criticisms leveled at him that say Stanley Kubrick gets le leveled at him in the sense that he almost seems to hold people at arm's length or like, you know, he has a very clinical or a very detached kind of way of looking at the world. Yeah. But I don't know. I don't know if I ever found, like, I see what people are saying, but I don't think I ever found that particularly. I don't find his movies... They're weird, but they don't. I don't find them particularly off-putting in the sense that, um, you know, the concept is off-putting, or I feel that they're cold or uncaring. Yeah. Um, and particularly Dead Ringers, where I feel like it does have a really like, uh, you know, kind of a heartbreaking emotional core to it, while still being kind of detached. And but I feel like Kubrick had the same kind of thing. It's like a hard thing to pull off, but. So I can see what people are saying when they make that criticism, but this this particular one visually, I think, is one of his best movies. Uh, the set, you know, they're not really sets, but the locations. And yeah, and, and he's people, and his uh, art it's, director, it's I think, has been the same woman for like a really yeah. long time. So she did like a whole bunch of his like yeah. very iconic movies. Well, you could tell the budget is bit, is pretty good on this one. This they almost had seems like almost like a mainstream movie. Yeah, um, well, because this was the one that came between... The Fly had come out two years previous to this, because Dead Ringers came out in 1988. And then after this, in 1990 or 1991, was Naked Lunch. Yeah. Um, you know, which was a, that was know, a, good a movie. novel adaptation. Yeah, I haven't seen that in a long time, but I yeah, remember... Yeah, I gotta get The Fly and Naked Lunch. I'm missing those two. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just watched The Fly recently, and I still love that fucking yeah. movie. I mean, that is a fantastic movie. Dead Ringers, it's like, it usually gets classed in with horror which i guess it is because it does have some touches of 
you know, a little bit of the gore, a little bit of the body horror that Cronenberg yeah. is kind of known for. But I feel like Dead Ringers is more uh, an internal movie in the way that he's more worried about the psychology of these twins and this weird, like, psychosexual, like, kind yeah. of exploring this weird psychosexual relationship that they have. Yeah. Which kind of physics, uh, you know, manifests itself physically a little bit, but it usually is, like, kind of kept inside. And they're gynecologists. And they're fucking weird. Yeah. They're kind of abusive. They're, they, certain... These two characters kind of remind me of, of Bateman out of fucking American Psycho slightly. Yeah, at you least know? Elliot does. Yeah. Yeah, uh, they do. One yeah. of the twins, yeah. And and another weird thing about this movie is that it's kind of inspired by a real a real set of twins. We did a show on it earlier. We did. We did a show yeah. about uh, Stuart and Cyril Marcus, twin gynecologists in New York City, who yeah. they found... Uh, they were dead in their apartment. They were hoarders, right? Or yeah. was that someone else that I was they thinking of? They were dead in an apartment filled with fucking garbage and they were shitting on the couch and they're just, man. Yeah, they'd, you, they'd, you know your life's taking a turn when, when you're, you're shitting, shitting on, on the, the couch. couch. <laughs> it's just their... Just uh, pro tip. <laughs> yeah, they're fucking... They lost their minds. Yeah. Some kind of joint psychosis. And these two dudes are fucking They call weird. that folie à deux. Yeah. Two dudes going madness, crazy. Sh- madness between two, or madness shared with two. Yeah, two. People Not just dri- dudes. It's two people like driving it's, each other crazy. Yeah, or like one like madness rubbing off on the other one. Yeah. They're like usually it's it's usually romantic partners or siblings. Yeah. Um. You know, we did a couple shows about that too, about like uh, crazy twins, like that kind of thing. So that's Don't you ever go crazy on me. I'm, I'm too. Cra- I'm you too, go crazy on me, man. I'm too you- sane to go okay. crazy. Yeah. And it, honestly, I think you're probably more in danger yeah. of that than yeah. I am. <laughs> It's all my mental problems. That's what I mean. I'm I'm too oh. like I'm too grounded. I don't think yeah. I could ever. I mean, unless but I vent mine. Unless something like I uh, vent mine. Unless something physical like fries in there. I I'm just had really that sure. Jack Torrance fucking inner voice and that thing from Venom <laughs> that goes. I, I want to see their heads roll like little toys. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> every time, seriously, every time we watch The Shining, which is a lot, you guys, but every time that scene with like Jack Torrance coming down the hall toward the girl where he's going, rah, 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 and I'm like, hey, it's you. Yeah. Because <laughs> that just, it reminds me of you. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like the, a mixture of Venom and Gollum yeah, in my I can, head. I can see that. Yeah. I can see that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, so uh, Dead Ringers is very loosely based on the case of Stuart and Cyril Marcus, and more. Uh, there was a book about them written that was called Twins, and he kind of got the story idea from that because he wrote it as, or at least co-wrote it as well. Now I will. Okay, so the whole story of this is that there's two twins, Beverly and Elliot Mantle. They were born in the 1950s, and at the beginning of the movie, they just show a very brief. Um, kind of prologue of them as kids and it's notable that pretty much the first conversation that these two have with each other is all about why humans have sex and it's because humans don't live in the water anymore they're like if we were still fish and lived in the water they would just like leave the eggs and somebody would swim over and fertilize them and everything would be easy yeah, it'd be boring. Yeah, but it'd be boring. but because humans don't live in the water they had to internalize the water Meaning that, you know, now we have now, yeah, we have the ocean inside of here. Yeah. So there is a really interesting recurring theme in this movie, <coughs> which is only, I think, evident to me now that I've seen it so many times. And I've seen this movie at least 50 times. I mean, I used to have it on VHS back in the day because I had taped it off cable. And it, it was one that I just like revisited over and over again. But there's something about it that is really compelling to me. I mean, I love Jeremy Irons um, and I just love his performance in this. The other thing about this movie that I had kind of forgotten until I was watching it again last night is that it's like really funny, like not in a like, oh, ha ha zany comedy kind of way, but in like a really like black humor kind of way. I mean, I was like laughing out loud at some of the shit. That they That's say. what I was saying. It's kind of like American Psycho because there was humor in that too, in a way. Yeah, it's, it's a so, similar kind of like right. it's like a very dark humor, like a very dry yeah. British kind of humor, which I like. So, so there's a theme in this of these two twins, who I feel like because they're so obsessed with the insides of people's bodies and particularly the insides of women's bodies because they come gy- become gynecologists they go they get to the top of their field um and they open their own fertility clinic where they're helping women get pregnant so i feel like the whole theme of this is 
that these two individuals are actually just one individual who cannot live without one another and their whole entire life is like trying to they're spending it trying to get back into the womb so that they can be one person again you know what i'm saying yeah. i mean that really seems to be a recurring theme of this movie yeah. <laughs> because the two you know and okay so both parts are played by uh jeremy irons now this movie came out in 1988 and obviously you know they've been doing like split screen type of stuff like people p playing twins in movies prior to this like even back in the fucking 50s and 60s and shit but this still looks and they didn't have cgi or anything like that really i mean i think they did it with some green screening and but you can't really tell like the way they shot it. You can't tell where the split screen is. You can't tell. So they ha actually did have, I think they had a little bit of maybe computer technology to do that, but it looks great. I mean, yeah. it still looks really good. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's believable. It's very convincing. Yeah, it totally is. And I think the one of the best things about it too is that Jeremy Irons' performance in this is such that you never, he never even has to talk. You can tell which twin that is. Just yeah. by, and his hair's not different. His clothes aren't noticeably different. It just has to do with, it's I don't. It's just, just the delivery. It's his body time. language. Yeah. It's it's everything. It's like yeah. the way he holds his facial expressions, and it's just like really, it's nothing you can really put your finger on. But the second you see one of them on screen, you yeah. know which one is which. Yeah, it's nothing about this movie, and, and a lot of Cronenberg movies, especially the older ones. The acting is good. But it's not usually as good as this. The acting in this is very good. I mean, I, yeah. there, there's a certain tone in certain Cronenberg movies where there's kind of, like you said, kind of like a sterility to it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It kind of, and it's like he's chosen actors that kind of deliver shit that way. Still and sterile. This one isn't really like that. Not this, at all. This one actually is, has really good acting in it. It is a very different Cronenberg movie. I feel it, like this different. was kind of at this point, and I'm not saying like the fly was the kind fly of. Fly is very different. Um, is, yeah. is different, but yeah. I do feel like this is almost a little bit thematically similar yeah. because the fly was also kind of a twisted love story. Yeah, the fly Which was this is too, kind of. The fly always kind of always kind of made an impression on me as would be like what if Steven Spielberg made a made a body horror movie <laughs> yeah that's kind of what cuz the fly had a very mainstream sci-fi even tone though it was to totally it. over the top even though it was over the top weird fucking <laughs> shit in it but it still it felt very mainstream like yeah. like you were watching a Lucas or a or or a Spielberg movie but it was it was Cronenberg yeah I like that movie. And I mean, well, yeah. everybody loves that movie. Kind of like don't... Species. Yeah. Species was like a mainstream movie that had uh, kind of dark tones to it. You know what I mean? I would I'd put The Fly on the same level as, say, like Species. Yeah. Remember the movie Species? Well, I think The Fly is way better than Species. But yeah. I, th I like Species, yeah. too. But I, think, I like Species I mean, also. The Fly, I think, is easily one of the best horror yeah. movies of the 80s. Um, and most people, I think, would agree with that assessment. It's just, it's a great movie. It's got, like, a great emotional core to it. Um, so that's why, why I think it's very confusing that when people say about Cronenberg being always so clinical and stuff. But he's actually very good at directing actors when he has really good actors. Because I think, you know, prior to maybe when he made The Dead Zone, um, you know, when, which had Christopher Walken in it, I feel like he, you know, because he was making lower budget I movies. That was yeah. When he was yeah. making lower budget movies, he maybe didn't have access to like kind of your big A list actors and everything. Yeah. So once he got, you know, you know, once Christopher Walken was in the dead zone and that got so much, you know, attention. So I feel like he had access to like more like and better actors. And he seems to be very good at bringing the best out of them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So. I mean, Cronenberg, Cronenberg was like, uh, this is fucking John Carpenter's favorite director. He was, he, they were buddies. Yeah. And man, when when Carpenter was when he was when he was on when he was on point, Carpenter was really good. But I'd have to say, I think overall, the just the total body of work, I'd have to give it to Cronenberg. I can't really think of a Cronenberg movie that I haven't seen that I didn't uh, enjoy to some extent. I don't know if enjoy is. I the think right a lot word. of the later. <laughs> I think a lot of the later Carpenter films didn't have Carpenter too involved in them. 
Yeah, they I didn't really the seem problem. to have his thumbprints like on them. No. They didn't seem like. Whereas when you see a Cronenberg movie, even you if know it's that's Cronenberg, even yeah. if it's not a horror movie, because he did go more in like a crime thriller direction mm-hmm. later, like when he made Eastern Promises and History of Violence and stuff like that with Viggo Mortensen, and um, you know they're still fantastic movies. They're just not the same genre anymore, but they're still you can still tell that that's a Cronenberg movie, yeah. and I think that's kind of like. Um, you know, just a testament to his vision and his genius and everything like that is even when he makes something in a genre that he's not really associated with, you can still tell that that's him directing it. Yeah, I guess you could say he he was kind of like the Canadian Kubrick, isn't he? Yeah, it's not exactly the same, but he does have a similar... It it is a very similar aesthetic, I guess. Well, I'm just saying in greatness. Well, that too. He's kind of like... like Canada's Stanley Kubrick. Yeah, and I mean, Kubrick and Cronenberg are two of my favorite directors. Yeah. I mean, my very favorite director is probably David Lynch, but I mean, you know, they're Kubrick and Cronenberg are top five easily. Kubrick was a man, though. He was a fucking genius. Well, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, so, all right, so, so you have these two twins, and like I said, it almost seems like they're not a complete person on their own because Elliot, uh, who is the more outgoing of the two like he's kind of the public face of their clinic like he's the one that goes out and gives the speeches and gets the grants and stuff like that but he's also very shallow and vain and a little bit sociopathic um kind of in the sense that he doesn't really care about anyone uh but himself and his brother whereas beverly is more, um, and I think the reason they gave him a quote-unquote girl's name, because, you know, later on somebody makes a comment about him having a girl's name, even though technically back then that was, you know, a name that could have been a boy's name or a girl's name. But, um, you know, he's kind of more, uh, you know, internal. He's more, he's the one that does the studying. He's the one that does the research. He's more shy. He's more introverted. Um, so, so it's almost like they're two halves of a whole, but they, you know, don't have, you know, they they don't have like any overlap, like in their personality traits, you know what I'm saying? So they, they can't like survive without the other, at least that's how they perceive themselves. Like they perceive themselves as one being, um, with just these two halves that go out because they, they switch places all the time because, you know, because they look alike. I heard a lot of twins are like that though. The, yeah, it's true. Twins. It's true. They're, they don't really differentiate much between one between one and the other. I mean, they got the same DNA. It must be really weird. I always yeah. thought. Like I said, I I have a couple sets of twins in my family, and I you know they always seemed like normal to me. But and they didn't do any like weird spooky twin shit yeah. <laughs> that I knew of. But um, and I could always tell them apart too. But uh, but I have but I always thought of that like when i was growing up because i used to hang out with a couple of my cousins that were twins and i always used to wonder what that would be like i'm like that i heard twin girls were usually more bonded than the twin boys though uh yeah that makes sense i mean just because you know in general like Like um, they wanted to live together and they wanted. well in general women are more like empathetic or more like you know connected with families and stuff like that not always obviously because that's kind of a generalization but in in be it weird we did that show on those twins, remember? Yeah, that's what well, I, I, I mentioned About half of them damn crazy twins were twin twin sisters. Yeah. They did crazy shit. Which reminds me, if you want to see another crazy twin movie, see Sisters, directed by Brian yeah. De Palma from the 1970s. We should probably do... I don't know if you've ever seen that. Margot mm. Kidder's in it. Mm. She plays the twins. Mm. Uh, that's kind of more a good twin evil twin, which I guess this one is too, but it, it this one is a lot more subtle than that. Yeah. Because what ends up happening with this one is that... So these two have... They're weird, but they're not, like, off-puttingly weird. Um, And I feel like they've been professionally successful. You know, they're geniuses. They've invented this, you know, gynecological tool that's now the industry standard, the mantle retractor. And, um, you know, have had all these accolades for it. So shit's working out for them pretty good. It's like, you know, they have a team thing going on. Uh, You know, they can switch out when they need to. If one of them doesn't feel like doing this thing, they can send somebody out to have dinner with whoever. And it's fine. You know what I mean? So, uh, you know, or, you know, do each other's patience or whatnot. So they seem to have this all sorted out. And then comes the destabilizing influence of Claire Niveau. Now, she is this actress that comes to town and she comes to their, uh, she's working on a miniseries or something. And she comes to their fertility clinic because, you know, she's getting a little bit older and she feels like, as they say in the movie, that her life is empty without a child 
And she has not been able to get pregnant, even though, as she mentions to Beverly earlier in the film, that she has been, quote unquote, very promiscuous Hmm. and has never used birth control. But she's never been able to get pregnant and she's wondering why that is. So they do find out later that she has a very rare, a fabulously rare mutation, a trifurcated cervix, which I think is actually a real thing. I don't know if anybody can have... Trifur- I've heard of like bifurcated ones, but basically the cervix has three openings when it's not normally supposed to have one. So uh, basically, you know, Dr. Mantle says, I don't think you can ever get pregnant. This is a very, it's a very unusual mutation, but she, cause she's like, oh, maybe I can have three babies. Like I can have triplets, like one in each compartment. Mm. And he's like, yeah, that's not how it works. Mm. Um, so she gets really upset about it and she's very vulnerable. Now she ends up, what, cause what's been going on is that Elliot, uh, the shithead brother, he, what he will do is he will seduce you know, any woman, maybe some, and some of their patients too, which is super unethical, but whatever. <laughs> and so he'll seduce one of the patients, then bang them for a while, and then he'll get sick of them. And then he'll pass them on to sweet, sensitive Beverly, because he says to Beverly early in the film, you would still be a virgin if it wasn't for me. <laughs> um, and they, they tend to like go after women that are from out of town, they imply because, you know, they don't know that there's two of them. So they can switch them back and forth without the woman being the wiser. And indeed, that is what happens with Claire Nouveau. Elliot bangs her for a little while, then he says he gets sick of her. So, you know, then Beverly starts, you know, then he passes her off to Beverly. Now, what ends up happening, though, is that Bev actually ends up falling in love with her. And subsequently, she finds out that she has been the filling in the Mantle Brothers Oreo. (laughs) And she is not happy about it she is like pretty fucking grossed out because she was starting to get i don't think she was suspicious that they were twins but she thought that bev because she thought he was the only one that she was seeing she thought that he was schizophrenic because you know sometimes she'd have a date with him and he'd be really nice and then sometimes he'd be a real dick and then so she thought there was something the matter with him but then later on she finds out through like a mutual friend or something that they're actually twins and she twigs pretty quick to what is going on they've been switching her out and she is completely disgusted by the whole situation as you naturally would be so she has a big thing and they you know they have a big fight and they break up however um Her and Beverly, like, Elliot really doesn't seem to care, because like I said, he's kind of a sociopath, and he was just using her anyway, and he, he mistakenly, I guess, um, tells Bev, it's like, oh, she was just, like, hitting us up for drugs, because she does actually, like, you know, they do actually start prescribing drugs for her, and, um, so he's just like, whatever, she's an actress, she's a flake, they're all like that, you know, she's messed up, they all all messed up, but Bev is really upset about it. So they do try to kind of come to some uneasy peace about it. But as it goes on, you know, Bev becoming, who is very emotionally vulnerable, him getting more and more involved with this woman is destabilizing his relationship with his brother. Now, also his brother is becoming kind of jealous of their relationship because, and he's also kind of upset that Claire didn't want him because of his ego, like, you know, because like I see he's very vain. So that kind of bothers him as well. So there's like this big, um, you know, conflict between all three of them. And he's kind of trying to pull Bev out of the thing, like trying to get him involved with his girlfriend. And they're trying to do a threesome with the two twin brothers. And it's, it's very messed up. Um, but as it goes on, Bev starts descending into drug addiction and madness um, to a point where, cause him and Claire were starting to do all these drugs and then he just, you know, she went off to do a movie somewhere else and he couldn't handle it. Like he couldn't handle her being gone. So he started taking all these drugs to a point where, you know, it, it was affecting his work. And then he started getting really crazy and thinking that all of the women that were coming to see him were mutated somehow because he had become so obsessed with Claire that because that was one of the things that drew their attention to her in the first place was her, you know, mutation of her cervix. So then he starts mistakenly thinking that every woman that comes to them has some kind of weird mutation. Like there's this one really funny, horrific scene where he's 
like he has the retractor thing and he's like sticking it up in this woman's yeah, his mantle vet. retractor. Yeah, and it yeah. and she's like, you know, that really hurts and he's like, whatever it's it, it doesn't hurt. It's not supposed to hurt and all this other yeah. stuff and like he's arguing with her about whether yeah. it hurts or not. It's like a solid goal it doesn't hurt. Yeah, and yeah. it's a, well and then later you find out that that's not even supposed to go there. That's not yeah. for that particular <laughs> thing. It's not like the speculum that is supposed yeah. to go up there that, you know, that's shaped like that, the right thing to go up there. But then he's like implying that she that maybe her insides are mutated because she slept with a dog. Yeah. And like all this other kind of stuff. So he's starting to like lose his mind. He goes to this like industrial artist at this gallery in town and he has all these drawings for all of these gynecological tools for yeah, working custom. on mutant women. Yeah, it's all this custom shit. That's why it looks like something, like, looks like, it looks like something out of crab legs and stuff. Yeah, it's just yeah. like these crazy... I mean, obviously, you look they look like torture implements. Is yeah. what they, I mean, they're beautiful looking, but when you look at them, you're like, yeah, I don't want that anywhere yeah. near my vagina. <laughs> Thank you. But it's like, so he has them made um, because he is starting to, like, all the drugs and his, you know, kind of emotional breakdown of her being gone and, like, him and his brother, like, being at odds is making him crazy and making him think that everybody is mutated. Like, I mean, he, he's arguing with his brother. It's, like, about the him, him putting the retractor in that woman's vagina and her, like, saying that it hurt. It's, like, it's not the tool. It's it's all of them. There's something wrong with all of their bodies. They're wrong inside. And, like, everybody's mutated. So he's starting to get, like, these delusions. So for a while, Elliot does... He's not a complete sociopath. He does love his brother. I don't know if it's so much love as he's dependent on his brother. Because he even says to his sort of on-off girlfriend that he doesn't... That he wouldn't have a career without Beverly because Beverly was the one that did all the research. I mean, Elliot was just the one that, you know, was the face of it because he was like a social butterfly. He was the one that did the speeches and stuff. So he was kind of like the, the outward facing thing. But Beverly was the one that was doing all the hard work behind the scenes. And so he's basically, well, I wouldn't have a career without him. So I need him. So he tries at first to, you know, detox Bev off the drugs. So he locks him in the clinic and he puts him, he, you know, makes him not take drugs and everything like that. But then it's not really working out. So then he gets the idea that, well, okay, maybe to do this, we need to synchronize. So we both need to be drug addicts and then I can, you know, be down there at the same place as him. And then we can both come out together. This, this is where I think it started to tie in. With, this is a fantastically where, bad idea. <laughs> yeah, I think it started to tie in with the brothers that, were, that this mm -hmm. was based off of you know, in real yeah. life. How fucking weird shit went with those dudes. Because after a while, and I, th I thought that was genius the way they did this in the movie, because after, a while, like I said at the beginning, you could easily tell which brother was which. But then, like, as it goes on, and they both descend, and they start feeding off each other's drug addiction and feeding off each other's madness, you can't tell them apart that well anymore. Like, you still can, but they start dressing the same, they start acting the same. So it's almost kind of like they're trying to... Merge, you know, or merge into one another which like i said that's kind of the theme of the whole movie is that it, they're trying to like get back into the womb where yeah. they were still one cell or whatever yeah. so you know what i mean because they can't i mean and there's really one reverse birth yeah so it's it, like i said that's why they're so obsessed with like the insides of yeah. women's bodies and so there's like there's this really great scene pretty much the only like quote unquote you know old school David Cronenberg body horror type of scene where Beverly has a dream where him and Claire are in bed and then you look over and uh and Elliot is over there too like looking at them and then they pull back and Bev and Elliot are attached like at the abdomen like with this weird fleshy yeah, Cronenbergian they're like, they're like Siamese twins yeah like Siamese twins because and yeah. that's another thing that repeats is you know telling the story of Chang and Eng and yeah. how they died and uh stuff like that that's kind of like a big touchstone in the movie as well and then you know the, then he's talking about we well, have to separate them and then Claire goes in and like bites through like trying to chew yeah. through the fucking flesh now apparently they shot another scene for this where I guess there was like um a parasitic twin was going to come out of Beverly's stomach. But I guess they didn't, either it didn't test well or Cronenberg thought that it was too much, which is strange yeah. because usually he's like gore. But in, I think in this movie, I think the restraint was the right thing to do. I think it could have easily gone 
really wrong if they tried to do too much gore or too much over the top kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? Because I like the way it just focused mostly on the psychology of the characters and how the character psychology breaks down rather than, I mean, I did like the body horror touches, but I think it was good that he kept it kind of to a minimum. Yeah, it just, I think it's a matter of opinion. I think I would have liked it to go on a little bit fucking weirder, actually. Yeah. It, it, just That's just me, you know what I mean? Yeah, fucking, I can see that. Um, the movie's very dialogue-driven and character-driven. For me, it doesn't really pay off as a horror movie. You know? I would call it more a psychological yeah, horror movie or a character so. study with horror elements. Had it got really weird at the at the, at, at the end of it and built up, I think I would have liked it a little better. I mean, this is a good movie. I mean... If I love this. Movie, if we're gonna, if we're gonna say that you know that Cronenberg is like is, is is the Kubrick of Canada, this would be his eyes wide shut. This you know what I'm talking about. This oh, is, I don't know about. This it. Is, I don't this, know if I'd say that. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Where it's not really over top. It was just 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 a good movie. Yeah. Because I like eyes wide shut. Yeah, I, do too. I didn't really like it on the first viewing, but on multiple yeah. viewings, eyes eyes wide shut got better. Although I have to say, I like this better than eyes wide shut. Yeah, Dead Ringers. I'd say, I'd say they're about on par. I mean, like I said, Dead I mean, Ringers is one of my favorite Cronenberg movies, and it's been one of my favorite movies from the '80s, like for a really long time. There's just something about it that I really like. And honestly, it's not—it's not just the horror elements. It's not just the psychology elements. I like a lot of the dialogue. I like the interplay between the two yeah. twins. I like, um, you know, the dynamic of this like fucked up relationship between the two of them and between this woman. Like some of the lines in it are so fucking great. It's like. You know, when fucking Elliot's up there giving the speech and, like, Bev comes in and he's all drunk and he's like, I want to say something, I want to say something. And he's like, you know, this, he's, like, talking about how they, how they separate the workload. And he's like, well, I slave over the hot snatches. Yeah. And he writes the speeches. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And yeah. it's just, like, this great fucking lines like that. Um, so I just really love, and I love the whole scene with uh, the first time that Claire <laughs> realizes that they're twins. Like, she sees them in the diner together and mm -hmm. realizes that she's been fucking both of them without knowing it yeah. and um and just like that whole interaction because elliot's kind of trying to pretend that he's never met her before and she's like not having it and then you know she's like oh there really is no telling you apart is there and he's you know elliot's like oh i'm actually a couple of millimeters taller and then she's like no i'm pretty sure i have another way i can tell you apart it's like he's the sweet one and you're the shit <laughs> yeah so it's just like there's just really great dynamic between the three of them even though it's just two actors when you... it's it's a good movie yeah, yeah yeah um it wouldn't be my first pick for a cronenberg movie i would say see the brood, brood or videodrome yeah first it's, or i mean fly. he's got so many good ones to right pick he's from. got a lot it's of so good ones if like, you like the favorite. movie if you like those movies and you haven't seen this one you need to see it because i feel like movie. this is more it this one took a while because like i said the fly was a huge success this one was like i guess kind of a success it's got like you know, pretty good reviews at the time. I feel like the reputation of this one has gotten better over the years. Um, it got a Criterion Collection, uh, you know, release a few years back. And it's turned up on a lot of lists, you know, top 10 Canadian movies. Um, you know, it, it comes up on a lot of horror lists, you know, and underrated horror and stuff. Even though, like I said, it's, it's a horror movie in a sense. But I think it's more toward the psychological horror that's, end. That's why I'm going to say that this is... Uh... This is Cronenberg's version of Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah, which yeah, I, yeah, I can see what it's you're like, saying. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's it. It stands in in Cronenberg's catalog. It's about at the same level of where Eyes Wide Shut stands in in Kubrick's catalog. Something that kind of aged better with time. It takes multiple viewings. Yeah, it uh, it got pretty good reviews, but it not as good as some of the other ones. It's something that kind of had to age, I think. And this one has really aged very well, yeah. I think. And the thing about this one, too, even though it's sort of loosely based on a true story where, you know, spoiler alert, they both died, which they do in the movie as well. But there's something really sad about this movie as well. It's very tragic because one of my favorite things, I just love, you know, when he when he has these tools made and obviously he makes a big show of like, you know, there are tools for operating on mutant women. But then later on in the movie, when Claire finds them because he's gone and stolen them from the artist and she's like, what are these tools? What are they for? And he says, he doesn't say they're for operating on mutant women. He says they're for separating Siamese twins. Hmm. And when he takes them back to his house and they both go 
into this like descent into madness and like they're fucking you know they have like crap and shit all over their apartment and they haven't been out anywhere and they're all sick and they're like eating cake and they look all fucked up and boxer shorts and whatnot and um so he decides he's going to use the tools and elliot says it's okay to separate the siamese twins so he's basically saying yes kill me Hmm. What he's saying is he wants Bev to separate himself from Elliot so that Bev can go have a life with Claire. You know what I mean? So that's that was why Elliot did that. However, that's not how it works out. Because Bev kills Elliot. He gets all upset about it. Yeah, spoiler. And then, well, no, I just said, I'm yeah, going to spoil it. They yeah. both die at the end. He kills Elliot. And then, like, he goes outside. Yeah. Like, he puts on his clothes. He packs up. He goes outside. And he goes to a phone booth and calls Claire. And she says, you know, hello, who is this? Or whatever. Then he hangs up. And then he goes back into the apartment and dies with his brother. And the and the last shot looks like the Pieta, which I think is very funny. Hmm. What's, <laughs> what's that? That At least you have, like, that Virgin Mary Jesus type oh, of okay. thing with, like, you know. Uh, you yeah. know, the Mary Jesus uh, thing that they always put in paintings and whatnot, the weights pause. But that's yeah. another callback to the Chang and Eng thing, too, because he had a little, he said a little rhyme earlier about what had happened to Chang and Eng that mm. one, of th- one of them had died in his sleep. And then when the other one woke up and saw that the brother was dead, he died of fright. And so it, it looks like that's kind of what they were setting up because it was like the dead one is up against the wall and then he's like laying across with his eyes wide open and he's dead. Hmm. Um, so like I said, it's a tragic ending because it's almost like Elliot, you know, obviously you knew it wasn't going to work out because you can't just kill a dude and wander off and everything be hunky dory. But symbolically, that's what Elliot wanted. He's like, you know, I want you to separate yourself from me and then go have a life by yourself. But Bev was not able to because he couldn't live without his brother because they weren't, they weren't an entire person, you know what I mean? Yeah. They couldn't be an entire person, like, on their own. They were two halves. So he couldn't live without his other half, so he just went back there and died with his brother. And so, it's like I said, it's a very sad ending. And honestly, Jeremy Irons was fucking amazing in this. Probably should have won an Oscar. He did actually win an Oscar two years later for a reversal of fortune. And uh, when he was up there accepting it, he uh, he thanked David Cronenberg. And it was, I guess it was because of this movie that he got to do it. And maybe that's what led to him doing Reversal of Fortune. I haven't seen Reversal of Fortune in a really long time. I remember that being good too. But I think I liked this one a lot better. Like I said, there's just something about this. It's not super over the top. It's not super gory. Um, you know, there's just like a couple touches of the body horror type stuff. You can still tell it's a Cronenberg movie, obviously, because of the art direction and because of the subject matter and uh this weird psychosexual undertone to it um but it's kind of a more i don't want to use the word adult (laughs) or it's kind of like a more mature movie maybe it's just kind of like his version of like a weird psychosexual drama you know what i'm saying or like a character study but as i said it's surprisingly funny as well like it has a lot of like really dark humor which i really like but yeah so if you if you like cronenberg and you haven't seen it because i know a lot of people haven't like weirdly i've seen a lot of uh reviews of horror fans that have seen a lot of other cronenberg but haven't seen this one um then i would definitely recommend you check it out because it's it's just really really good like the acting is really good and it's just like this really weird creepy experience um so that'll do it for our movie retrospective Uh, Remember, like, share, subscribe, all that jazz, and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye.